All right, guys, so in this example here, we have refrigerant R134A entering into an insulated diffuser. So we'll draw a diffuser like this as such. So we have our inlet and we have our exit. We'll call this point one and we'll call this point two. So the inlet on the left and the exit on the right. And at the inlet, we have a saturated vapor, so a quality of one, X1 equals one. We have a temperature of 80 degrees Fahrenheit. We have a velocity at 1 equal to 1453.4, that's be feet per second. And then at the exit, we have a temperature of T2 equals 280 degrees Fahrenheit. We have a velocity at 2 that we're told is actually negligible, but we can set that equal to 0. It's effectively going to be equal to 0 feet per second. And then we're looking for the pressure at the exit. And it's going to be some number in PSI, which is pound force per inch squared. Now, another piece of information we're told is that this is an insulated diffuser. Because it's insulated, we can go ahead and draw our insulation around the diffuser. And that effectively just tells us that the heat transfer coming in or out of this diffuser is going to be equal to zero. So my approach for this problem would be to find another property at the exit that would therefore allow us to find the pressure because, as you may or may not know, if you have two properties, you should be able to find the rest of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply the energy balance equation over this diffuser. And so we'll have that zero equals the heat transfer minus the power plus the mass flow rate times the change in enthalpy H1 minus H2 plus the kinetic energy, which is going to be V1 minus V2, and those are both squared. And, of course, there are the velocities. Divide that by 2. Plus the gravity times Z1 minus Z2, and this, of course, is your potential energy. Now, we can make some simplifications here. Um, first and foremost, from from the... First sentence of the problem, we're told that it's an insulated diffuser, so we can go ahead and cross out our heat transfer. Next, a diffuser doesn't have a shaft to generate power, such as uh, a turbine or to consume power like an electric motor or a pump. So we have no power because we're not generating nor consuming power. And furthermore, we could even simplify by removing the mass flow rate. If we divide both sides by the mass flow rate, you don't actually need it for this problem. Uh, also, we're told that potential energy can be neglected, so let's go ahead and cross that out. And now what we're left is, with is 0 equals H1 minus H2 plus V1 squared. And we can just keep V2 equal to 0 because it's essentially negligible. And we're going to divide V1 by 2. All right, so now my thought is because I have two, two uh, parameters at one, two properties at one, we have the, sta the state or the quality of X1 equals one, we have a saturated vapor, and we have a temperature of 80 degrees Fahrenheit, we should be able to find H1, and we are given our velocity at the inlet, so we should be able to have our V1 over here, and this just leaves us with H2. H2 is going to be an unknown property at point two at the exit. And once we figure out H2 from this energy balance equation, now we're going to have the temperature of 280 Fahrenheit in H2, and that should be able to get us all the other parameters, such as the pressure. All right, so let's go to our properties table. So at able, a, table A10E, which is the R134A saturated table for English units, we have 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and then we're looking at our saturated vapor, Hg. And if we see where those two line up, we have 112.56. Unit here is BTU per pound. So we have 0 equals 112.56 BTU per pound. And I'm going to designate a pound mass. It's good to get the pra into practice of writing pound mass instead of pound because you can get confused between pound mass and pound force. So that's just my two cents. Next, we'll subtract H2 from this, so minus H2, which is some unknown number. And then we're going to add our V1, which is 1453.4 feet per second. And then we're going to square this whole unit and divide that by 2. Now we'll rearrange for H2, and we have H2 
equals 112.56 BTU per pound mass plus 1453.4 feet per second. Going to square that and divide that by 2. And now before you conduct your calculation here, you want to make sure that your units are making sense because is a BTU per pound mass consistent with a, a foot squared per second squared after you were to square out this unit here? Well, let's figure out what a BTU per pound mass really is. So let's break this unit here down. BTU per pound mass is equal to what? So let's break down that BTU first. So from the conversion factors chart, uh, somewhere past your cover title or your cover page of your textbook, you can see that a BTU from right over here is equal to 778.17 feet per pound, feet times pound force. So I'll fill that in. So we have 778.17 feet times pound force. And this, of course, is just your BTU. So just this term right here was moved over to here, or converted over to here. And we're going to divide that by pound mass. And this is why it's important to differentiate pound force and pound mass. They're not the same thing. So now we're going to break down that pound force. So how can we break down pound force? Let's go back to that conversion factor chart. And we see from the force chart down over here, the force area of this conversion factor chart, we have one pound force equals 32.174 pound mass times feet per second squared. So what we'll do is we'll pull out that pound force and we'll say that that pound force is equal to 32.174 times pound mass feet per second squared. And this, of course, is just equal to this single term right over here. Your single pound force, whoop, sorry about that. Your single pound force unit right over here was pulled out and moved into this unit here. So now the remainder of what you have left is just this area here that you're gonna multiply out. So now we have this 32.174 pound mass feet per second squared times 778.17 feet per pound mass. We can simplify this a little bit, so get rid of that pound mass, get rid of that pound mass, and you're going to be left with feet squared per second squared. But of course, you have some constants here that you have to multiply out. So if you do multiply those out, you're going to have all that equal to 25,036.8 feet squared per second squared. And this here is the conversion factor that's equal to a single BTU per pound mass. So as you can see, these units here are not the same, so you have to add a conversion factor. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. So we have our BTU per pound mass on the left, and I'm going to keep it as that because I want my enthalpy in that unit. Um, but our velocity or our kinetic energy here, I'm going to convert at the conversion factor right over here. So if we... Already have feet squared per second squared. I want to divide by feet squared per second squared. So therefore, we have twenty-five thousand three hundred. Sorry, twenty-five thousand thirty-six point eight feet squared per second squared for every one BTU per pound mass. Sorry to be a little messy there, but now we can cross out our feet squared per second squared from both of these units, and you're going to be left with BTU per pound mass. Now, this would be a feet squared per second squared after you apply the square to that, but you're still going to apply that square to the number separately and then divide. And now if you plug this in your calculator where you have 112.56 plus 1453.4 squared divided by 2 times 1 divided by 25,036.8, you should have that your enthalpy at the exit equals 154.75 BTU per pound mass. And now that I have two pieces of information being the temperature of 280 Fahrenheit and the enthalpy of 154.75, I now have two properties, which I can therefore use to approximate my, my exit pressure. So if we go to our property table and we look for 280 degrees, we can see it's not on there. So I'll go to the superheated tables here. 
and we're going to look for 280 Fahrenheit, and we'll see where we are. So at 280 Fahrenheit, we have 164.13 BTU per pound for enthalpy. We're all the way at 154.75. So we're going to keep on going. We're going to fix our temperature at 280 and see where uh, we can get out, where we can get closer to our enthalpy of 154. So at 280 here, we have 161. At 140 PSI, at 160, we have 161. Here we have 160, 160. Here we have 157.63. And then at 400, at 280, we have 154.72. So 154.72 and 157.63 are, are, are our closest two numbers to our 154.75. So if you really wanted to, you could just approximate and say that your P2 equals 400 PSI. But if you wanted to be more exact, what you would do is you want to use linear interpolation You'd set up a column for pressure and then a column for your enthalpy. And you would look between 300 and 400 PSI because your number is going to be in between. So at 300 PSI, you had 157.63 BTU per pound. And then at 400 PSI, you have 154.72. Now you're at 154.75, which of course is greater than the uh, enthalpy of 400 PSI and 280 Fahrenheit, and it's lesser than that at 300 PSI. So you'd be in between, and this would be your P2. And if you just did your linear interpolation, you'd find that P2 equals 398.97 pound force per inch squared, otherwise known as PSI.